I think you're a self-indulgent sot with an overactive imagination. And the only thing you like better than scotch is sympathy. I'm going to give you just 24 hours to straighten out. Get rid of that bottle and get rid of the crazy obsession that you're battling a dummy. Hello and welcome to Twilight Poem, the internet's third most popular Twilight Zone podcast. Talking about our third most last episode to discuss. <laughs> my name is John. I'm joined by my co-host Fred. Hello. For all our brand new listeners, welcome. <laughs> welcome to the dying days of a once glorious <laughs> empire. <laughs> right. Did you pour yourself a double Tito's there, John? Or you uh, sound pretty hyped. I was in a rush. I've got my Magner's Irish Cider before oh, me today. Nice. So, yeah. Yeah. I usually like to do the podcast dry. Mm-hmm. Um, I've got a bottle of seltzer, and I've never bought this brand before. It's a plea brand. This is <laughs> well, like- yeah. Like we, we have this... To call it a joke is a bit a bit kind to both of us, but we have this thing where this joke we had in college where Schweppes was like the stuck up pretentious ginger ale and Canada Dry was the ginger ale of the people. And I'm kind of confused about this. It's called the White Rock and it's got a fairy on a glacier. <laughs> kind of looks like a, it's like a nickname for cocaine in the late eighties or something like that. It sounds like street soda. Or what, <laughs> yeah, what? exactly. Yeah. Anyway, my week has been good. I actually uh, just this morning watched Chinatown. Rewatched mm-hmm. China, Chinatown for like the tenth time. My fiance had never seen it. She enjoyed it to her credit. You know, sometimes I have yeah. a bit of bit of a problem. You know, keeping her awake for the old movies, but she she really enjoyed it. And um, yeah. the nervous man in the four dollar room, Joe Mantell, uh, plays Jake Kidd as his partner. We've discussed that in the cast before, but it was just mm-hmm. cool to see him and recognize him and annoyingly point that out to my fiance. <laughs> <laughs> Look, honey, <laughs> George. <laughs> I think we've dropped several Chinatown references over the years. It's a, it's a oh, solid yeah. movie. Very good. It's one. a solid movie. Yeah, it's it's a you know it's a good B minus movie. <laughs> no, no. I mean, I think it's, it's one of my favorite. It's one of my up, favorite movies. I think. Really? Yeah. It's often held up as like an exemplar of one of the best written movies. Yeah, yeah. You know, for screenplay people, they help consider like it and. I don't know. What are the other ones that really get held up purely on screenplay? I feel like Tootsie, weirdly, <laughs> often. Like, just, you know, from mechanics of, like, this is, like, perfectly written. Yeah. Um, um, but Gremlins. Gremlin. Well, yeah, the new batch. <laughs> right, more, right. So, but right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I've had the opportunity in Austin. They do, like, a summer film series, and they'll show old movies on, like, this big old like very grand kind of makes you feel like you're going to see a movie in the 40s and i saw chinatown there it's like it's a movie i like a good deal but i don't know it's it's not i wouldn't put it in my favorite favorites but i really like detective movies so i think that just like Mm. that helps it is a little slow at times but i think it's there's just kind of a nice like languid we do talk about the twilight zone sometimes no Uh, not this week it's kind of funny because like i've been listening to a couple like old episodes of the podcast like kind of Mm -hmm. going down memory lane and uh, in the very beginning of the show, we didn't have any of this pre-show no. banter. And now, episode uh, <laughs> now 154. Now it's Fred on the couch, just <laughs> waiting for the stars to come out. Yeah, yeah I will I say, know. potentially unpopular opinion. Yes. This is really going to stir the pot Ooh. <laughs> among our listeners. Did not like the long goodbye. Oh, really? Um, Interesting. The Robert Altman, yeah, uh, yeah. Philip Marlowe one. Uh, yeah. I'm not a big fan of... Um, What's his name? Elliot, Elliot Gould. Gould. Yeah, Elliot and Gould, like yeah. it being a Robert Altman movie, it's like half the movie is just people mumbling. I found yeah. it like kind of impenetrable. It's certainly not like the best detective movie ever made, but it's interesting. I mean, The Long Goodbye was Chandler's like kind of attempt to like take the character into a more philosophical, intellectual realm. It's a lot like sadder yeah. than the rest of his books. Yeah. Um, it's also like a little bit less good than many of them so i don't know i understand that i like it but i I think it's you know it's like one of those things where like if you like westerns everyone's like you gotta see the searchers and like right i like the searchers but i you know it's mainly just kind of like weird and long you know it's not (laughs) like it's so great you know it's got a great last shot so true true this is all the perfect setup to our discussion (laughs) uh this is our 
Oh, we're in our last three yes. home stretch. Yes. Can we make our plea, by the way, for people to write in now oh, sure. as opposed to yet? We just we're gonna have like a big grand finale uh, episode, and we'd really love to hear from listeners um, to get your thoughts for it. You know, I'm assuming people don't listen to the whole podcast. And yeah, we, most people turn this off <laughs> <yes>. <laughs> the first few minutes when they're like, "Damn it, are they ever talk about the episode?" <laughs> Last week we did it at the end. This week we're gonna do the beginning. But yeah, we'd really love to hear from you guys. Yeah. Any questions you you would have for me and John? Yeah. Any favorite memories? A, a from the podcast or B from the Twilight Zone or just, or just you, our life, you know. Yes, right. If you want our measurements, Favorite trips we've taken yes. in college. But yeah, and if you want to, you know, record yourself reading the question or sharing the memory, that's great. Or just email us twilightpone mm-hmm. at gmail.com. But please do pipe up. This is this is your yeah. chance. Yeah, All right. New listeners, jump in. Yeah. So, John, what are we talking about for our final three? What this is, is it, number tri- three? Ultimate episode? Yeah, tri- ultimate. Yeah. <laughs> We will be discussing The Dummy. This is a third season episode. I believe this makes it our last third season episode. Mm-hmm. It is the 98th of the production run. It aired originally on May 4th, 1962. You're watching a ventriloquist named Jerry Etherson, a voice thrower par excellence. His alter ego sitting atop his lap is a brass stick of kindling with a sobriquet Willie. In a moment, Mr. Etherson and his naughty pine partner will be booked into <laughs> one of the out-of-the-way bistros. That small, dark, intimate place <laughs> known as the Twilight Zone. <laughs> That's a great one. I don't. I, I don't care what anyone he says. That, that one I gotta just hand it to Rod and Nutty Pine Partner, <laughs> Silbercat Willie. It's also kind of like short, but it feels quite long because there's Punchy. like a hundred thousand words in it. <laughs> you know, it's very good. So we like to do our own Serling style intros. Um, I think I'm first. Mine is kind of high concept. Oh. Is yours? No, mine's pretty are... straight. Okay. Do you mind if I take the reins? Take it away. I did practice this once. I think I probably should have practiced it a little more. Than more, that. more than usual, though. So We'll see. <laughs> Significantly more. All right. Good evening, and welcome to the Twilight Zone. Hey, isn't that the way you're supposed to end this little speech? Why don't you let me handle this, little Roddy? <laughs> the only thing you're handling right now is my little wooden derriere. Now, Roddy. Please, this is a family program. A family program where little kids are run over by cars, married to thousand-year-old aliens, or fall out of their beds into the fourth dimension? Roddy, it's all about entertainment. Sounds more like interdangerment to me. Can we get to the task at hand? You mean your overly wordy description of the show this week? As a point of fact, this is precisely what I intended to... Oh boy, here we go! Rod Serling and Little Roddy will be appearing nightly at the open mic night in the back of the Desperate for a stream of new customers, any customers, coffee shop in the Twilight Zone. <laughs> nice. I think you found your true calling there. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds great over the over the air, anyway. <laughs> yeah, I lost any ability to do a Serling when I was juggling there. <laughs> you could just see the balls go flying everywhere. <laughs> yeah, we did discuss this uh, when we did our episode on um, Caesar and me, but it, they really dropped the, dropped the ball on not having Serling do a ventriloquism routine. They had two yeah. chances, and they blew it both times. <laughs> So, you're welcome. (laughs) All right, here's mine. You're watching a ventriloquist named Jerry, a voice tosser par excellence whose career is far from excellent. Excellent, more like it. After investing in real estate at the bottom of a whiskey bottle, he and his plywood pal Willie are facing a hard truth that they may have missed their chance at big-time ventriloquism success presuming such a thing exists. Flailing, Jerry ditches Willie in favor of a hip new dummy half his age. <laughs> Willie, fearing a Pete Bestie in fate, pulls a trick that one might call Shakespearean, assuming Shakespeare had ever written a play about an alcoholic ventriloquist who gropes showgirls. This act appearing nightly at the CD clubs of, well, you tell him, Willie, the Twilight Zone. <laughs> Oh, we both kind well, of had our little touch. Nice. <laughs> oh, we both went for the low hanging fruit. No, no, I mean yeah. we didn't do it for the last dummy episode. <laughs> true, so. true, true. I had to double check my notes. I was like, wait a minute, did I do this? <laughs> no, okay. not that it matters. But uh, That's right. anyway, um, this is a third season episode. Um, you can check it out on Netflix, Hulu. Of course, you could also buy the Blu-rays and DVDs. But mainly, I tell you this so you can avoid spoilers because we are mm-hmm. about to ruin the plot. Said plot opens, unfortunately, on a (laughs) ventriloquism act. It's uh, Jerry, the ventriloquist, and his extremely creepy doll, Willie. It's quite a long act. I mean, I don't know. Like, I don't have much to say. It's fine, as ventriloquism goes. 
yeah, I grabbed a little bit of their banter, but you know what? No. It's, <laughs> okay. it's ventriloquist. It's classic stuff. You yeah. know? <laughs> it's classic meh. They do do the bit where the dummy wackily takes over control yes. of the person. Yes. You got to wonder who was the first guy who thought of that bit. <laughs> You're probably like a billionaire now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, Donald Trump's dad. <laughs> Spoken of in like hush tones in yeah. ventriloquism circles. Yeah, it's kind of like the Robert Johnson of <laughs> it was the <laughs> blind ventriloquist from Mississippi who <laughs> sold his soul to the devil. The crossroads exactly. to come up with that one. I mean, it has a meaning for the episode. It's a bit of foreshadowing, but... Uh, it does work here. It but just it's gets kind of confusing. Classic. Like, when you're just like, wait, what's going on? Ugh, well... <laughs> end please serling's intro comes at the end of his act and it's a really great intro because like i think this is like the studliest serling appearance oh hell yeah i mean i don't have the good solid memory to rank these but this is like a top five serling intro as far as just his like appearance in the scene his act is finishing up and we're we pan across the crowd is all kind of applauding and laughing Mm -hmm. and then like sitting at one of the nightclub tables serling is just like yeah folks Hey, yeah, <laughs> it's me. <laughs> I don't know. He's just like he's sprawled. He's got a cigarette oh, going. Yeah. Like you can tell, he just like smacked a waitress on the backside. <laughs> yeah. Like he just looks tough. I think probably a well practiced uh, <laughs> pose for Rod Serling. I, don't, I think they basically just filmed this, uh, you know, at the the Brown Derby after hour. <laughs> Rod was there. Let's just do it. The other thing I thought was funny just about this introduction is they show, you know, the acts going up, going on. And the crowd is loving this. Did oh, yeah. Notice how much the crowd, they're like going insane about this. <laughs> Especially like when he makes the ventriloquist head spin, people are just hemorrhaging. It made yeah. me think there must be like an eight drink minimum at this point. I love it. I love <laughs> it. it. It reminded me of in Wet Hot American Summer when they bring in like yeah. the, the Borscht Belt comic yeah. at the end, just telling lame jokes and everyone's just screaming. Like, <laughs> well, maybe like, you know how when they film like a movie that has like a concert as a central part of it and like, right. like you know, like Josie and the Pussycats or whatever, and they have to get an actual oh, crowd sure. there to see, you know, to film them. And so, you know, when they're filming the movie, they get like a real band to come and perform and right. then film the crowd reacting to that and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So maybe they got like the Beatles to, to do this. <laughs> and then they just kind of went in and put the ventriloquism act on top of it. <laughs> I don't know. know. After Sterling's intro, we get back to the act. There's a little bit kind of where Willie the dummy is like pleading with the audience to save him. And he mm-hmm. like it's part of the act that he's going to bite Jerry. But it's clear when we cut to sort of the behind the curtain shot that Willie really did actually bite Jerry. He kind of pulls back his finger like, ow, that's smart. And uh, yeah. the showgirls who are about to go on kind of look on with some bemusement. And then indeed in his dressing room, Jerry examines his finger and it indeed has kind of a comical little bite mark on it. I kind of wondered, like, did he just bite his finger for that shot? Or I don't know. Maybe the prop that's master came on and... <laughs> Gave it a good chomp. I don't know. <laughs> this has to look just right. It's kind of a cool little moment because the act is kind of goofy and shticky. And then immediately when Jerry, played by Cliff Robertson, gets backstage, his mood completely changes. And he's very kind of like disturbed, right. depressed looking. It's, he reaches into the dresser to pull It's not up. unlike when we stop recording. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> kind of true, sadly. I put Fred sadly. back in the cabinet. <laughs> There's an element of truth. To Listeners, that. he's alive. I'm telling you, I'm not crazy. Yeah. Well, if you'll forgive the meta indulgence, but there's an element of like, you know, when I first call you to Skype, it's like, hey man, how's it going? Like, um, yeah, cool. Yeah, anyway, well, let's get going. <laughs> Welcome to the Twilight. <laughs> Pull back the curtain. Anyway, our, sorry, sorry. Air all our dirty laundry sorry, now. It's, is it's, that it's, it's you know, it's it's time. It's time they knew the truth. <laughs> I'm gonna start doing this podcast with a goofy guy in glasses <laughs> yeah exactly we were actually not friends in college we were placed together by a talent <laughs> agent <laughs> we've come to hate each other at this point <laughs> anyway there's kind of a i would say relatively creepy little sequence where jerry is yeah. sitting there looking at you know the little uh, makeup mirror pouring himself mm-hmm. a, a nice big glass and he keeps looking over and willie's head is kind of like turned to the side then turned to look right. at him then turned to the side I think it pulled off the scare very well. I think it's a good creepy vibe. It's, you know, yeah. it's not too much 
and it's you know we haven't gotten straight into the you know dummy talking to us so yeah. like the less you can make the dummy talk yes. the better as <laughs> the far better. as the creepy vibes <laughs> yeah. so this this was a good choice the less italian <laughs> mobster he can be the better <laughs> right. so yeah at this point jerry's manager or agent or whatever um mike mm-hmm. comes in and berates him for drinking on the job it doesn't have to be this way you give in to some bad hooch and then you have bad nightmares. It's as simple as that. Take away the hooch and you take away the nightmare. No, you got the chronology wrong, Frank. First the nightmares and then the hooch. I drink because I have to. And I have to. Because I am. Now, I liked this setup. It yeah. reminded me a lot of Nightmare at 20,000 Feet, where you've got like a supernatural aspect to the story, but you've grounded it with you've got a guy who has a grounded a relatable problem, problem. Yeah. so like nightmare 20,000 feet you got the guy who's just been let out of the mental institution for anxiety or whatever but he's going to be put in a terrible situation here you got like a drunk or at least the people around him think he's just a drunk which yeah. could justify like what he's trying to explain to other yeah people. no it's true it's it's a smart way to set it up although mm-hmm. i do think there's something kind of funny about like i don't know my note was like God, not another 50s plot about a hard-drinking, poetic, dark ventriloquist, you know? <laughs> There's an element of, like, ventriloquism no- noir about it, you know? Fred, I don't think you've done enough time in the club. You yeah. Know? It's dark in there. I mean, it's just... You don't spend hours of your day talking to a piece of wood unless you have some problems. <laughs> I mean, know? I know, I know. It's just, uh, you know ventriloquism just it just lacks dignity fundamentally <laughs> and to make your protagonist like a deeply troubled ventriloquist just it, it makes sense and it works it's just a little bit like part of me can't help but snicker at that a little bit ventriloquists are like the people who couldn't quite make it as improv comics yeah, exactly. so it shows you how bad they've gone off the path assaulted nuts kick me out again <laughs> right. i can't make it to level four <laughs> it's like my class yeah i don't know the manager is kind of giving him the old you know you could have been on top of the ventriloquism game. The fight escalates. I can't help it. You can't help it. You know what it is. You've been told. Often, endlessly, up to my craw and overflowing. Schizophrenia, I know it by heart. Patient feel helpless and manipulated by forces outside of his control. I can give it to you frontwards, backwards, in again, out again, in again, in three different languages. It's like a well-rehearsed, off-color gag. Patient goes from himself to a lifeless dummy and then is unable to separate himself from the dummy. Oh, that's all very psychiatric and erudite and worth about two and a half bucks a word, but it's not right. It's not right. I told them that. I tell you that. It's no more schizophrenia, paranoia than his athlete's foot or a head cold. Well, he's alive. He's a dummy. Ah. He's a block of wood. Look at it. Does this thing look alive to you? Well, does he? Yeah, he kind of makes it seem like, ah, it's... It's the oldest thing in the book. A ventriloquist mm-hmm. thinks his doll is real. Like <laughs> even to like a pretty hardened psychiatrist, I have to say I think that would uh be an interesting case. See, I don't know because the only pieces of drama that I'm aware of that involve ventriloquists yeah, usually true. involve dummies coming to life. So <laughs> good point. maybe it is more common. Yeah, good point. It's like a name for it. Yeah, but that is a very, very solid Serling argument there. Oh, yeah. you know, you've got yeah. people yelling at each other with, you know, throwing out what, erudite and like other $10 words. Sobriquets. Knocking people yes. in the head. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know. I think they did a good job with it, though, because, you know, sometimes it gets a little bit like, I'm yelling very complicated right. sentences. But, like, I felt like they pulled I, it off relatively well. I think you put that on the actor. I mean, I think yeah. Cliff Robertson's a pretty solid actor. Yeah, and, you he's know, great. He was able to handle the Serling dialogue. Which yeah. The manager, I thought, was good, too, much. you know. Did you notice there was a line in here? The manager said something about like how much time, like unpaid time, he'd invested, and <laughs> yeah, basically, I know, like yeah. it just kind of made me think like you really, you know, do a lot of free work for a ventriloquist. <laughs> yeah. Like what you kind of hinted at this yes, in your intro. Yeah, yeah. Like is that you're really expecting the big payday to come <laughs> yeah. out of that? Like, I gotta feel like there's a pretty low glass ceiling for ventriloqu- <laughs> ventriloquist. Maybe like yeah. sure, after like Edgar Bergen, after he like. You know, hit it big. Maybe a lot of people thought there was yeah. just going to be this big market for more. I mean, I think there is, like, there was a time when ventriloquism was, like, a more popular act. But, like, I, I feel Still, like it was always like a novelty. More popular yeah. Yeah, Yes, more. It's like jugglers were more popular at one point. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, but they were always, I think, kind of a novelty. It wasn't like there was ever, like... agent. Yeah. Like at best, you're making like ten percent of whatever this person's made. Like, what I know, you I think? know, I know. It's it's kind of funny oh, because boy. like I actually have a friend who 
has written like her entire like PhD thesis about ventriloquism, and I no, ne- really? neglected to get in touch with her for this episode. <laughs> oh boy. Anyway, yeah. So um, Jerry comes up with a solution to this problem that Willie is mm-hmm. alive. Now, I have to say that is a little bit weak. I mean, this solution really could have presented itself years and years ago, but whatever. The solution is that he's just going to use a different dummy, and there's a dummy, you know, conveniently enough in his little wooden case that he can use Mm -hmm. for his act. It's kind of like a goofy-looking, glasses-wearing, sort of nerdy (laughs) dummy, kind of not unlike a certain podcaster (laughs) who's talking right now, and... uh, yeah, so this this dummy is called Goofy, and uh, I found it funny that there's this whole debate about like, oh well, yeah, I have this new doll, but I have to come up with a whole new routine. Like, what? <laughs> <laughs> is, is the routine? Fred, clearly every ventriloquist has to carefully tailor their act to the dummy. I mean, yeah, I mean, maybe <laughs> if it was like a like a ventriloquist that was like. Okay, the immediate example that came to mind was like an ethnic stereotype routine, but like right, if, we both thought of Jeff Dunham. Yes, right, <laughs> so, exactly. But I you mean, can't like, just put like the Pablo the Pepper or whatever his name yeah. is. You can't do the bits for Woozle. Yeah, I, <laughs> I mean, I just, Peanut? I just feel like Willie. I mean, sure, this new dummy is like yeah. has glasses and looks kind of dorky, but it's not like the material from the opening routine is like. So specific to, like, a dummy it's that doesn't things. have like, <laughs> glasses. I don't know, you know? Like, Willie's a kind of a bland, nondescript dummy. Yeah, oh, yeah. No offense, but, like, I feel like, yeah, the Willie material you think would work well with Lenny. If anything, Lenny it's gives goofy. you a little more with Goofy, gives you a little bit more with the glasses, you know? It gives you even, like, another layer to work with. Yeah, I gotta say, so, you know, Goofy's the future. I just think it's amazing that, you know, Willie just happened to be there. I, this is like Lana Turner being <laughs> yeah. discovered at the soda shop. This yeah. is... uh, at this point, Jerry starts kind of like riffing out a new routine with Goofy. I don't know. I think Willie is like sitting on the couch at this point, kind of with his arm yeah. up, like looking on <laughs> sort of like, oh, bravo. <laughs> Great routine. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's got a weird feel of like a cuckolding video or something. Whoa. John, John. <laughs> Sorry. Clean right. Clean right. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about, but clean right. <laughs> clean right. All right, let's shift dramatically. I had no idea what was said here. Maybe you can tell me. Tell him I can't make the late show. Tell him I'm sick or something. Well, I've already told him you're sick or something. The trouble is, they know it's something. And they know something's bottled in bond. What did he say right there? Bottled in bond. Bo- like the, the bottled in bond. Yeah, what like, does that mean? Well, I don't exactly know what it means, but I think that like sometimes you used to see like whiskey that's like bonded, and I think that means that it's like okay, yeah, it's, it's a like, label for American made distilled beverage. Yeah, it's like a kind of Asian certification. Bond. Oh, okay. It's, it's more common in, like, old spirits. Like, you hear it in movies and, like, detective movies, ironically enough. It's like, is it bonded or what? You know what I mean? Okay, yeah, got it. Yeah. Okay, yeah, this is all through Chinatown. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. Uh, it, full circle. It all comes together. <laughs> so we cut to the late show or whatever it is, and um, mm-hmm. Jerry's trying out um, his routine with Goofy. Uh, right. Which I have to say, given that he had uh, like 20 minutes to come up with his routine yeah. or an hour, is remarkably well put together. He's even got like yeah, a new prop. He has props. Yeah. What the hell? <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. The guy's like, I don't. It takes a long time to develop an act. He's like sent out and got props. He's like carrot top over there. That is like, the same night, right? Yes. Okay. It's the later okay. show. Yeah. He said like you've got to do this show coming up soon. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, uh, you know the goofy routine seems to be going. Fine, I guess. I don't know. It doesn't seem objectively better or worse than the Willie routine. Mm-hmm. But apparently the the club boss, we sort of see him talking to Jerry's manager. He doesn't yeah. like the new act. Well, the thing is the club boss gives a very apt review yes. of ventriloquism <laughs> yes, in does. general. Yeah. Novelty. For the ventriloquist? <laughs> Frankie. You've seen one, you've seen them all. Every dummy looks the same. And if just once they changed the jokes, I'd have a, a coronary. <laughs> Yeah. Yep. So. Pretty much. <laughs> but that's I, kind of how like America at large <laughs> yeah. has responded to dummies. He speaks for all of us. Right. But it is weird because this 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 bit opens up with him saying like I don't like the new act. You know what I mean? Right. It, it kind of goes back on itself there. Well, I mean, I think that's what makes the bar owner a complex yes, character. Yes, exactly. It's much like Chinatown. Every Everything's there for a reason. And he's put on a ventriloquist act, so he's clearly, he's got an inner conflict. <laughs> yeah, it's true. He clearly hates himself because he's green-lighted <laughs> a ventriloquism act. I think what's really going on here is he just, 
he loves ventriloquism, but he hates to admit it because we all know ventriloquism isn't exactly cool. I mean, and this, I think, is the question I've been dancing around but wanted to get to. Yeah. Maybe now might be as good a time as any. Fred, have you ever enjoyed ventriloquism? <laughs> like, have you ever? That was a lot of either... setup for a question that has a very simple answer. No. <laughs> You've never lusted after your own ventriloquist <laughs> doll or uh like watched any ventriloquism and laughed is the confession forthcoming here because I, I no <laughs> i was just i was just trying to get you out no yeah. no uh, what's, uh, what's going on next <laughs> crazy scary do- no i did really like jeff dunham when i was little oh wow thought, okay. like a woozle named peanut and that all stuff i thought was hilarious and i definitely like We'd go to weird antique curio shops, and I'd kind of look longingly at the <laughs> old creepy dummies. Never had one. Often wanted one. Yeah, I maybe like owned a marionette at one point, which I understand is a gateway drug. But uh, I think I but tangled you up. Just kind of use that as like a metaphor of how the capitalists keep the proletariat in <laughs> chain. True, exactly. Like he was like, I represent the landowner in this situation. Now we will cut the strings, Fred. <laughs> yeah. Cut the string. Oh, God. I, I hope new <laughs> listeners will understand the complexity of the fact that my my dad was a, a communist rabble rouser in the 70s. But anyway, getting back to the plot, the club <laughs> boss doesn't like the fact that Jerry doesn't come around and shove the dummy in people's faces and trying to get them to drink. <laughs> yeah, see, that's part of working at any club. You got to go around. You got to try and get the table dances. Yeah, I don't, exactly. I, don't, I have to say, like, <laughs> just the concept of, like, he needs to take the dummy around to people's tables. Is that like to clear the room? Or like, are people like, oh, I got to go to the bar to get a drink to leave this situation now? If you were in a club and enjoying a ventriloquist act, I can think of no better way to sober you up and make you feel yeah. like uncomfortable with your life than having the ventriloquist come directly to you. Yes, exactly. It's just like you need that wall. Yes, exactly. That, the sanctity of the fourth wall between an audience and a ventriloquist ventriloquism act is it's very <laughs> sacred anyway yeah so he's unhappy and the manager's unhappy everybody's unhappy except for jerry because when he gets back into the the green room he puts willie in a trunk shuts it locks it nails it mm-hmm. and he's gonna hit the town with his new flame goofy <laughs> there's very much like he kind of just got on got goofy out he's like putting a robe around <laughs> like uh, there's a very right. like how you like me now? But um, <laughs> Mike, the manager, comes in and they need to talk. I yeah. found this to be kind of a weird beat because things seem to be on the upswing. Like Jerry's like happy again and he's got a new lease on life. But I guess at this point the manager has kind of given up on it. He talks when I don't talk. He tells jokes I never heard of before. Gives me bum cues. He's alive, Frank. That's why I locked him in that trunk. Gooby and I are going to fly out of here, Frank. Gonna fly to Miami, Los Angeles, maybe that place in Kansas City. The place in Kansas City is the same as Miami. Which is the same as Los Angeles, which is the same as Sioux City, Iowa. Which is the same as any town southwest north of here. They're all the same, Jerry. And you're not gonna leave, Willie, by hopping a plane, or a train, or a taxi, or a one-horse shay. This thing you lick right here. This thing you lick at the source. This thing you... Don't run away. From me. Yeah, I mean, like, it's a great speech, but it's like, does, like, this thing that, like, feels like it's taken from leaving Las Vegas really belong in, <laughs> in an episode about a ventriloquist? I don't know. Well, A, I don't think as a rhetorical device you want to lead with lick. Yeah, like, it's true. This thing you lick at the source. Yeah. This thing you lick right now. Like, yeah. no, that's not yeah. the word. Yeah. And then B, I don't know if this is, like, a thing for ventriloquists. <laughs> Maybe they all just know it, like, you know, with alcoholics, you say, like, you can't run away from the problem because you're the problem or whatever. Like, maybe it is like, you just can't run away from your dummy. Yeah. It's just going to be there waiting for you no matter where you are. Like, no. Is it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Whatever. <laughs> I, I mean, we're, we're having fun. Yeah. I think the, the reality under the scene is that the manager thinks he's a drunk, not just a person who needs a new dummy yes, to solve his yeah, problem. Yeah. So, which, which, and I, I actually do think it's. You know, it's well written and well performed. The problem is there's good drama and there's good moments in here. It's just hard to really accept the seriousness of the drama when it involves dummies. Yeah, yeah. It's yes. just tough yeah. when you, like, keep cutting to a shot of Willie looking, you know, PO'd. <laughs> <laughs> all this, like, it instantly deflates any drama. Yeah, they're trying as hard as they can to bail out the boat, but... 
<laughs> that water just keeps going, pouring back in. Jerry's on the way out. Um, he's kind of like, I don't need you anyway. I'm going to hit the town with Goofy. Right. But as he starts to leave, he hears Willie's voice calling out to him. Um, which is obviously somewhat disturbing. He starts smoking in an alley behind the club, but Willie's voice continues to taunt him. Um, yeah, I've got, I don't know, there's like a lot of taunting here. I'm not yeah. sure if this is where this comes in. What do you say, stranger? You slumming? <laughs> a funny thing happened to me on the way to the club tonight. I was out in front of the Ritz of Boy. I was out in front of the Ritz of Boy. That's where I live, out in front of the Ritz of Boy, out in front of the Ritz of Boy. <laughs> Yeah, Cliff had fun that day. So there's like a long sequence full of canted angles where... um, The music and sound are trying like hell to make this scary. Yeah. I don't know. It is kind of like disturbing. I don't know if it's scary. It's it's just kind of like seedy and like, ugh. But like... Yeah, anyway, at, at this at some point he runs into this... Um, I'm just waiting to see a Willy rollerblade by in the yeah. shadows while he cackles. This so. is America, Jerry. <laughs> you and me. He runs back into the club, which is completely shut down at this point. And yeah. in the green room, he opens up the trunk and uh, smashes the dummy to bits, uh, <laughs> which the director at least had the dignity to film more or less completely in the dark um, right. so we don't see it but we do do get a pretty like gory shot of uh, a dummy completely smashed on the floor i like, can't believe they were able to show i know this. i know <laughs> network exactly. yeah God. but uh it turns out that it's not willie who got <laughs> smashed to kindling turns out willie pulled the kaiser sose <laughs> pulled a little switcheroo with goofy and uh he's got got quite the pwn to deliver to jerry I don't have this clip. Which we don't have. (laughs) (laughs) But it was amazing. Believe you me. (laughs) Um, What was your reaction when you saw it was goofy? Because, like, it's a good, clever twist, but it just made me crack up. I mean, just the idea that, like, the dummy's a criminal mastermind. (laughs) Uh, I actually, yeah, I liked it. I mean, I've seen, I saw this episode for the first time, I don't know, 20 years ago or something. So it's hard for me to, like know what my genuine reaction was i think it's good i didn't really crack up all that much but i do know what you mean it has like a weird quality of like it's, now you see me now you don't like it's <laughs> the episode has done an okay job at staying relatively subtle as far as you know yeah you really don't see the dummy move yet you yeah hear it when it's talking it could just be in his head you know there's like a subtlety to it yeah this is like the first little crack in the floodgates <laughs> where you like they haven't shown the dummy moving and doing all this stuff but you just know it had to happen so i'm already like giggling i know what you mean you don't really want to imagine the dummy like tom cruise in mission impossible like pulling (laughs) off like a mask and being like it's me (laughs) Um, but i i I like it i do think that like to some degree it's just hard for these things to be dignified at all but i think this one just Tried its damnness, you know yeah, what I mean? I will, I'll give him definitely a solid E for effort. Yeah, exactly. And actually, we're almost to the end of the episode here. How can you be real when you're made of wood? <laughs> <laughs> you made me real. You poured words into my head. You moved my mouth. You stuck up my tongue. You jerk. Don't you get it? You made me what I am today. I hope you're satisfied from the song of the same name. what you will about willie he's not a sad sack like yeah. uh, jerry yeah. you know he loves his work <laughs> it's called charisma yeah, That's what... exactly. just imagining like cliff robertson like you know recording that voiceover in the booth <laughs> just being like 
you know, he's a very method actor, so it's kind of right. like I'm sort of envisioning him I'm like sure Martin Sheen in Heart of Darkness text. or whatever. Right. No, that wasn't quite unhinged enough. After that, we sort of cut away, and uh, when we get back, we're at yet another ventriloquism act. Uh, this mm-hmm. time it's in Kansas City, and uh, an announcer tells us it's Jerry and Willie, so familiar ground. But they're filmed yeah. very conspicuously from the back here. And then slowly as the dumb, sticky jokes uh, roll out, we sort of slowly... They're all pig people! Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we slowly pan around and we see that they've switched places. And the uh, ventriloquist kind of looks sort of like Willie or like a guy in weird makeup. Cliff Robertson has become Michael Shannon. Yes. As the, like, that's the, the horrifying twist, but I don't really know what the dummy looks like. Yes, exactly. Uh, the dummy, just, I mean, you know, you get that it's Cliff Robertson, but, you know, right. I don't know. It's it's cute. Yeah, whatever. it's, like, it's cute. Maybe, yeah. Or did he, like, just kind of get a weird facelift and another new dummy? You know, it's <laughs> yeah. not entirely clear, but yeah. yeah. Okay. But that's the end, and then Serling takes us out. What's known in the parlance of the times is the old and, switcheroo. Uh, we along From boss together. to blockhead oh. and a few uneasy lessons. And if you're given to nightclubbing on occasion, check this act. It's called Willie and Jerry. And they generally are booked into some of the clubs along the gray night way, known as the Twilight Zone. That's Rod indulging in a little punning there. Gray mm, night Rod's, way as opposed to great white fun. way. Yeah, nice. he's having a lot of fun this week. Yeah, exactly. So what is it like, what are we supposed to believe, like, happened? Yeah. Yeah, I had this <laughs> twist. I read a little bit yeah. that indicated this is, like, you know, up there with classic TZ twists, like sure, shocking yeah. endings. And I, I get it because it's, you know, visual and... yeah. It's a reversal of sorts, but we just haven't really understood the mechanics of Willie well enough to, like, really, for me to be able to process what I'm looking <laughs> yeah, at. Yeah, like, exactly. It's like, you're telling me one thing that you've got a dummy that's, like, can talk and can move. Okay, but, like, I don't know, I guess that last little speech is supposed to indicate when he says, like, you made me, you created me, maybe there's some kind of weird symbiote, but I don't know. The fact that he, like, takes over his whole body... I. Yeah, it's odd because the you made me, you created me thought seems to indicate that it's all just in Cliff Robertson's head and he's driven himself crazy, which would seem to indicate that really like he and Willie are basically the same thing. Right. So then when we get this idea that they switch places, it's kind of like, well, they were, it was already Cliff Robertson. Well, maybe it's like a primal fear ending, like maybe like Willie has so taken over Jerry's personality that he started to like dress and try and make his face look like Willie. I don't know. It's yeah, just, I mean, it's, that's like a plausible explanation, but my reaction to that is kind of like, okay, like, I, I don't know, like, <laughs> yeah, it doesn't feel... Yeah, going for like a more mystical, like, somehow the dummy has become Jerry and vice versa, yeah. but it's just kind of like, huh? I also like the, and also like, what? is that really so ironic? Like, now the dummy <laughs> has to deal with his annoying agent and like, <laughs> life on the road in Kansas City. And the dummy's like, you know... Sometimes, Cliff, I I yearn for the days when I was maniacally chasing you around a back alley, and you were the one lugging me on Greyhound. The twist ending kind of raised a big question for me, which is, is Willie evil or just kind of a little (laughs) off? Yeah. He did cause the murder of Goofy, and that's a pretty big blotch uh, on his record. That's true, but, you know, he was feeling very threatened. True. He was put in a very dangerous spot. True, I guess my yeah. question is more directed to before things really spiral out of control. Like, yeah. What was his problem? As far, Jerry kind of complains, like, he tells me lines I don't expect and blah, blah, blah. But, like, he's not like Caesar. He's not trying to get him to do, <laughs> like, a life of crime. He's just basically, like, a comedy partner that... Yeah, it's weird that a dummy can talk and is sentient, but it doesn't seem like he's doing anything bad to Jerry when we first opened... Yeah. Well, I guess... He bit him, but... But yeah. Jerry kind of... Well, I don't want to be, like, victim-blaming, but, like, Jerry kind of provoked him. Um, I think that term is probably better used in other contexts, but, other I, context. but I, I hear what you're saying. I mean, like, him biting him is more, like, part of the routine, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think this episode is probably best just understood as just, like like a horror story, you know what I mean? Right. Like, like when Chucky comes to life and stabs people, 
we don't ask why. Like, we don't. Well, but Chucky, I believe, and listeners correct me if I'm yeah. wrong, I believe it was like a soul of a serial killer. Okay, yeah, that's got true. transferred yeah, into no it. good point. As yeah. far as I know, this is just like a pair of entertainers who, like, the relationship is strained. <laughs> Jerry kind of overreacts, kicks the one guy out, starts, you know, showing off with his new hot yes. number right in front of him. Right, yes. And then gets, like, surprised when Willie pushes back. Yeah. The goofy thing was bad. Yes. But I just don't think Jerry's as blameless yeah. in this situation. This whole episode is like a metaphor for, like, the career of Hall and Oates. You know what right. I mean? If I'd read the Steve Jobs biography, I'm sure I'd find all kinds of parallels <laughs> yeah. between Jobs and Waz right yeah. now. Uh, anyway, um, you mean... Was and Willie or something? I have no idea. What we doing next? Bios and trivia. Bios and trivia. Bios and trivia. Yeah. Mark Scott, Zickry, Mark Grams Jr., Zickry and Grams and IMDb. Zickry mentions how Serling was quote greatly influenced by several other evil dummy movies or television shows which yeah and it just kind of like underlined the point that this was kind of already well-worn ground before he decided to go for it the first time yeah i I wonder maybe there hadn't been a a plot exactly with this twist ending i think probably maybe we can say that and listeners can can let us know if we pulled a boner on that but yeah Mm mm-hmm well, wait, doesn't, like... Certainly dummies being evil had happened before, but... No, doesn't Devil Doll with Mystery Science Theater have basically this ending? The great Varelli becomes the dummy at the very end? Oh, yeah. And the dummy is freed? Does it? Does it? It's been a while. And that's a terrible movie, so... <laughs> wait, and when, I don't when know. was Devil Doll filmed? Yeah. Okay, it was 64. Four, yeah, so, so after contemporaneous, this. No, but after this. Or, okay, yeah, slightly after. Okay, fair enough. But it was based on a story. True. That, <laughs> that was it was based on a 1951 story. So okay, all right, all right. Some of the stuff that was influenced. There was a 45 British film called Dead of Night, and then an episode of Alfred Hitchcock Presents called The Glass Eye, which kind of loosely also had evil dummy plots one way or another. Yeah. According to Wiki, the dummy used in this episode was originally created in the 1940s by puppet maker Ravello Pitti. <laughs> cool. Uh, eagle-eyed listeners will notice that the same dummy was later used in the episode Caesar and Me. No. Really showing his <laughs> r- showing the dummy's range. Yeah, exactly. You know? He just disappeared into that role. He could play horror. He could play Scorsese-esque yeah. mob thriller. Yeah, exactly. It says the actual dummy has been housed in a private collection in Connecticut since the late 70s, but now resides in David Copperfield's International Museum and Library of the Conjuring Arts in Las Vegas. So... Listeners, if you want to send in some donations, yeah. then I'll make a field trip. Yeah. Also, uh, there's a bit in on IMDb about like how it's like, or on Wikipedia about how it's like regularly cleaned by like this one like dummy expert. And I went to his page, and he's like, mm-hmm. just has this like robust niche career of just being the guy in America who knows most about ventriloquism dummies. And <laughs> I don't know, that was kind of like a weird rabbit hole. And do you think there's like a like some guy who's number two who's just living in a shadow, <laughs> yeah, exactly. so angry for decades. Like like Euro dreams of sushi or something. Yeah. Like you know he's better, but Alan Seamock just coasts on the name. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I can relate to that. I mean, you know, you know, we are the number, yeah. we are the third most popular Twilight Zone podcast. Totally. I did write down a lot of stuff for my weird Alan Seamock dummy expert rabbit hole journey. Right. Apparently, there was a movie called The Dummy starring Adrian Brody that was released in 2003 or something, which I never heard of, which is awful. Mm-hmm. Apparently, Sherry Lewis, you know that woman who had that routine with yeah, the pup? Lamb Chop. Lamb Chop, exactly. Apparently, she contacted Rod Serling when she found out that they were going to do a Twilight Zone episode with a doll, you know, a ventriloquism dummy, mm-hmm. and wanted to be in it. But I don't think she understood really? what they were going to do. So, he. I would have thought you were going to say she called like afterwards and was angry about <laughs> the portrayal, like it would scare kids or something. That's interesting. No, apparently, you know, she wanted to do something with Rod. Maybe she like had some rough experiences with lamb chop over the years. <laughs> yeah. I can relate to this. Um, yeah. There's some interesting stuff in uh, Graham's about how the writer Lee Polk mm-hmm. was like a Twilight Zone fan who uh, you know he was a writer too but he he was a he was a fan of the show and wrote a story treatment and it was the first one Sterling had wanted to do a ventriloquism story for a while but this was the first one that <laughs> really grabbed his attention. Yeah. 
You sound like Michael Bay right there. Like, he'd been in love with the idea of a dummy yeah. project for years. He'd worked with a stable of writers, just couldn't crack it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Graham's clearly uh, tracked down uh, Cliff Robertson and um, mm-hmm. talked to him. And Cliff, Cliff, if you'll remember him from uh, 100 Yards Over the Rim, was like a very method mm-hmm. actor. Like, he like wrote like right. a novella about his character in that episode. Right. And for this, he, you know, watched, quote unquote, his good friend Edgar Bergen perform with Charlie McCarthy and Mortimer Snurd. So I could reproduce mm-hmm. the mannerisms of ventriloquist for called Cliff Robertson. Right. You know, I think he did an okay job at it, and, and so does he. But he goes on to say, I did two of those Twilight Zone episodes. I had a reservation on an American Airlines or Pan Am flight from New York to California for one of them. I believe it was the dummy. I was scheduled to arrive in Hollywood days before they really needed me. I was scheduled for a later flight, and someone told me I'd get in trouble. But I just did not see any reason for flying in and waiting for my turn on camera. I'm now glad that I did it, because soon after the flight took off, the pilot had a heart attack and everyone perished. That episode of The Twilight Zone almost killed me. Which kind of reminds me of 22 in a weird way. Although real people died, so that's sad. Wow, that is very crazy. Yeah, I was thinking that sounds a little like apocryphal and Mm weird-ish. But I looked it up and there was indeed a flight uh, that flew out of New York and crashed like four or five days before the episode film. Wow. It it was not due to a, uh, a heart attack, so... Huh. Nice one, Cliff. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah. Oh, that's, that's crazy. Yeah. Cliff Robertson played Jerry Etherson. He also was the voice of Willie and the voice of Goofy Goggles. <laughs> he was also in 100 Yards of the Rim. Frank Sutton played Frank. I don't know. He had a long career in television. I figure there are certain listeners who will be very upset unless I mention that he played Vince Carter on Gomer Pyle. <laughs> So, <laughs> yes, we've gotten a few very irate emails about like how we mixed some, up. I don't know what they call them, pylons or <laughs> yeah. something. But but, so, I mean, big pile, man. <laughs> I, I understand, but like there was one email that yeah. we got that was explaining the difference between Gomer and Goober pile, and like I get it because like if someone like you know thirty years from now yeah. was like, yeah, you know, Fred, Chandler or Joey, either one of them, I'd be right. like, no, they're very different characters. But like, come on. <laughs> but still, it's not even like. Uh, not to get too defensive of Friends, but like Friends and Gomer Pyle, as far as, you know, popularity in the zeitgeist. Yeah. I mean, it's more like if you were like, if you were really arguing over the characters on like, just shoot me or something. Yeah. It's not. Like, yeah. We okay. can let that one go. History will let that one go. All right. George Murdoch played Willie as the ventriloquist off stage. I just found this little weird little line of trivia in his IMDb page. Along with Dean Cain, Terry Hatcher, Patrick Cassidy, Michael McKean, Richard Grant, and Rob LaBelle, he's only one of seven actors to appear in both Lois and Clark, The New Adventures of Superman, and Smallville. <laughs> he's like, one of only 28 <laughs> actors to appear in two like, small television shows. It's not that unique a company <laughs> yeah. when you get that many names. Yeah. Like, two people, okay. but Yeah, it's also like... I feel like that was an interesting piece of trivia that just kind of eroded over the years yeah. as more and more people were... <laughs> yeah. John Harmon played Georgie, who's also in Of Late, I think, of Clifferville. Sandra Warren played Noreen. She was also in A Nice Place to Visit. Ralph Manza played the doorman. He was also in some 80s episodes of The Twilight Zone. And then Edie Williams played one of the chorus girls. Mm -hmm. She was somewhat interesting in that uh, Russ Meyer was her mentor turned husband. Hmm. She... Her IMDb page is interesting. You might want to go check it out. She just, you know, she led a risky career. She was apparently known for, like, her outrageous outfits on the red carpet. She would consistently try to be, like, the worst-dressed person. Or, Hmm. I don't know, her fashion sense often won her worst-dressed. Edie Williams. I wasn't familiar. I haven't actually ever sat down and watched a Russ Meyer movie. It's just, you know, it's not my thing. Yeah, interesting. Written by Sterling, based on a story by Lee Polk. Directed by Abner Bieberman. <laughs> Indeed. This closes out the... Bieberman Oeuvre. Yeah. I think it's the first time in history Bieberman Oeuvre has been... Yes. Those two words have been put together. What's? It? I'm sure there's lots of Belibermans. <laughs> yes, so Bieberman. He also directed I Am the Night, Color Me Black. Right. Number 12, Looks Just Like You. Right. And the incredible world of Horace Ford. <laughs> which one of these so is which not one like, like the other? Which one you like? You like? You, you remember Horace Ford when he when he was playing one potato, two potato, two potato, two ring a levy <laughs> um, Well, the the worst one is an easy choice. Um, <laughs> yes. I think I Am the Night, Color Me Black has to be ruled out just because it's like a little bit of a dud episode, even though I think the directing yeah. is actually remarkably good. I feel like... Yeah. Probably number 12 looks just like you is is, is got to be it. What do you think? Yeah, yeah. I, I can't quite remember what number I gave that, but just 
that's the one that jumps out to me yeah. as most enjoyable, most well put together. I mean, I think there's a lot of good directing in this episode. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I think it's pretty close for me, but I think just number 12 wins out a little bit. We can discuss it a little more. I do think this is a very good directing job, so I don't know. On directing job, this maybe is better. On episode, maybe number 12. Yeah. It's close. Horse for it's terrible. All right, that brings us to the inevitable, 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 inevitable. So we like to find connections between Mystery Science Theater 3000 and the Twilight Zone. This week we have one that we suspect we've already done, but uh, we ain't going out like no punks for our last three episodes. John, what do we got? Well, I don't want to be the one who asked. Okay, to okay, fair, later. fair enough. I was the one who found this. I don't. Do you have it in your notes? Because it's William Tuttle, okay. the makeup artist. Yeah, he, uh, who was like a pretty famous makeup yes. artist. Yes, and Hollywood. he also did this this movie called Girls Town, which they they did on yeah. Mystery Science Theater 2000. Right. I suspect we've already done it. It sounds familiar to me, but lay off. <laughs> now, I yeah. think you also noted he did the makeup on the what is it called? Ooh. The Seven Faces of Doctor Lowe. Yes, um, true. And we might have mentioned that and not the girls' town thing. I don't know. I just, I'm nervous that we mentioned Tuttle. And, <laughs> I can tell. You know, the in, <laughs> we already, the incoming internet backlash. Yeah. I just, I don't want to be caught in that wave. I can tell that we're, some, some fingers are poised over some keyboards right now. <laughs> right. Anyway, so that's our MST3K connection. What about uh, IMDb ratings? IMDb gives this episode a 7.9. So it's actually just shy yeah. of greatness you know i think once you're in the eights you can feel pretty confident yeah. that's like getting into the top third like 7.9 is kind of middle creeping towards the higher levels yeah i like this episode a lot actually it's one of these weird situations where it's probably a bad idea to do anything with a ventriloquist dummy because it's dorky <laughs> and cheesy yeah. and it's already been done but that aside they did a good job with yes. it like i really like cliff robertson's commitment to it i think the directing is mostly very well done they did what they could. It's got a, uh, if sort of nonsensical twist, it's got a like a shocking mm-hmm. twist. And I think if you just take it yeah. as purely like just sensations, like the sensation of being surprised by this or the sensation of Willie mm-hmm. being creepy and not try and like think too much, I think it's like it holds up and is like an enjoyable half hour of TV. So, you know, it's definitely not a 10, but I think it's, I think it's pretty good. What do you think? I'm pretty conflicted. Hmm. I think a lot of my problem is having watched caesar and me before (laughs) this episode i I really do think that like casts a pall over (laughs) all ventriloquist related media that i will consume in the future but what can live up to to the high standard set by caesar and me yeah you know i'd seen like evil doll things before and thought they were well except for as i've said i think the book magic is very solid but generally it's like it's a very high degree of difficulty (laughs) Triple sal cow of, yeah. of horror premises. I'm conflicted because do I think this is, like, scary at all? I agree that that first scene has, like, a good creepy vibe. But after that, you know, it's just not really hitting for me. But I do think the acting, like, I think Cliff is a really good actor. I think he does a really good job. and You know, he's clearly given a lot of effort. And I do think the directing is doing a good job like that first sequence by not letting us see the movement the like you said having so much shadow to like kind of i think in some ways kind of buffer out how ridiculous it is that a grown man's like crushing a doll and i do think maybe the directing goes like a push too far with like all the canted angles and cacophonous noise and a screaming laughing dummy (laughs) but i mean like it's clear the director's just trying yeah there's a lot of there's it's like there's a ton of effort of the like maniacal dummy genre yeah it's probably a good example and i think you're right that the twist ending is it's very memorable it's yeah it's just not really coherent yeah so it doesn't like i mean yeah. like there's a world where i could give this a three or a four but i also think there's a world where i could give it like a six or a seven i just i'm not really sure i think I think I'm going to come down at like a six plus. I think there's just a lot of problems with trying to do an evil dummy story, but if you're going to do one, this might be about as good as it can get. (laughs) This is the Chinatown of evil dummy story. (laughs) For me, I I come in higher than that. I think it's an eight, maybe eight minus. 
I think it's an eight minus. Mm -hmm. I just, I found it like pretty much enjoyable front to back. You know what I mean? Like yeah. even when it is a little goofy, it's like kind of part of the campy fun. I don't know. You know, right. I don't, I don't feel as conflicted about it. <laughs> Caesar doesn't link, you know. I didn't sleep last night, <laughs> yeah. Fred. Cool. All right. Well, that wraps it up for the dummy. Uh, was that a request from anyone? That was requested by Ginny Boo on Twitter and Anonymous on Tumblr. So Thank you, guys. Next week will be our second to last episode. And let's keep it a surprise because once we tell them our second to last episode, they're going to know what the last episode is. The last two episodes that we're going to be discussing are The Bewitching Pool and Where Is Everybody? And so yeah, you're so going to have to Vegas wait until next will be week taking to find out which one it is. This. It's very exciting. Yes, exactly. But in the meantime, if you want to get in touch with us, and just a reminder to send us questions, comments, thoughts, reminiscences, we'd love to put yes, them on our, our big grand finale retrospective episode. Retrospective app. Yeah. Yes, a look back with John and Fred. But yeah, how can people get in touch with us, John? You can send us an email at twilightpwn at gmail.com. You can get in touch with us on Twitter at twilightpwn. You can check out our website, twilightpwn.tumblr.com. Like us on Facebook. Listen to us on any kind of podcatcher app. If you're over on iTunes, if you leave us a rating or review, we really appreciate reading those. Podcast Obsessed, I forget if i mentioned last week you're trying to sneak in with another review but you know we appreciate yes. those I, we appreciate if everyone them, wants to double Anything dip to bolster we'll up those numbers. You know? yeah exactly thank thanks much we're over 100 so i feel feel good yeah. i feel like we've done our yeah. done our work you know so like this the switcheroo that uh, willie pulled there where he like mm. changed identities with goofy and and escaped yes. uh, smashing and obviously that was quite a dastardly switcheroo but like mm -hmm. have you ever pulled the switcheroo or known anyone to pull an interesting switcheroo like that like that in, that in any context, even like a joke or... Was trying to kill me, but I was able to get a patsy well, to take the Well, I don't know. No, I... I like like, like on head, April Fool's sure. or something like that. Tangentially related to your question, I've always felt uneasy around twins, so... Because I worry that they're just constantly <laughs> playing the switcheroo on me. <laughs> this is just for getting to the end of the, uh, the <laughs> podcast and all of your weird bigotries coming out. <laughs> I will say I've always felt time. uneasy around twins of a certain ethnicity. I won't say which. It's not about race. It's about what, what are twins? I don't know. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's just get out of here. Well, we still haven't been sued. Let's leave. Okay. All right. All right talk to you next week, John. <laughs>